you read a book of the Bible, often a single passage within that book will refract the themes that run through that book. Matthew concludes and climaxes with the Great Commission, but the Great Commission is not a surprise tacked on to the end of Matthew's Gospel. It's, it's, a, it's a message that pulls together many of the themes that run through Matthew's Gospel. We are to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that Jesus has commanded. What we have there is an imperative surrounded by three participial clauses. Isn't that exciting? What it means is we have a command that's carried out in three ways, by going, by baptizing, and by teaching. The going part of it is, is fairly obvious because we're making disciples of the nations, of all peoples. And this is a theme that runs all the way through Matthew's Gospel. If you start in Matthew chapter 1, you've got, you've got the genealogy, Jesus' heritage. And even though ancient Jewish genealogies often didn't, usually didn't in, uh, mention the women ancestors, uh, you know, of course today we would, we would include them, but Matthew includes four of Jesus' women ancestors, not the famous ones like Sarah or Rebecca, but he includes four women who are either Gentiles or have Gentile connections. Even though the purpose of Jewish genealogies was to highlight the purity of one's Israelite ancestry, this text specifically underlines the mixed nature of Jesus' heritage. Chapter 2, you have the, the, the Magi, uh, these, these Persian uh, wise men, basically astrologers, and you would expect them to be bad guys based on the way that language was used in the Old Testament. But instead, they come to worship the one who was born king of the Jews. In contrast to Herod, the king of the Jews, who wants to kill the male children of Bethlehem, that is, he acts like Pharaoh in the Old Testament. You have the king of the Jews who acts like a pagan king, and yet you have these people that you expect to be pagans who come to worship the king of the Jews. Matthew subverts our expectations. Chapter 3, God can raise up children for Abraham from stones. Chapter 4, Jesus settles in a place in Galilee of the Gentiles, quoting scripture. Chapter 8, you have a, a Gentile centurion who comes and Jesus says, not even in all of Israel have I found such faith. And later on he casts out some, some, uh, some demons in the Decapolis area uh, from some, some Gentiles and, and heals them and delivers them and uh, the demons go into the pigs. This is probably where we get the expression doubled ham. But in any case, uh, you, you have this continuing uh, uh, Sodom and, and Gomorrah and and Nineveh uh, and Sheba, if they had had the same opportunities, they would have repented, Jesus says, in chapters 10, 11, and 12. And in chapter 15, you have a Canaanite woman. I mean, if there was anybody that the Jewish people despised as much as the Romans, it was the Canaanites. And yet, <clears throat> this, this Canaanite woman receives her request from Jesus because she persists in faith. And you also have at the, at the cross, the centurion and the execution squad in Matthew chapter 27, who are the first after Jesus' execution to acknowledge that Jesus is God's son. You also have in Matthew 24, 14, the good news of the kingdom must be proclaimed among all peoples, among all nations, before the end will come. So this is a theme that runs all the way through Matthew's gospel and climaxes in the end. Yes, we are to make disciples of the nations, and uh, part of that is by going, part of that is by teaching. You go through Matthew's Gospel and you see all of Jesus' teachings, a lot of teachings about discipleship. You, you have to be willing to abandon your livelihood like the, like the fishermen did. You have to be willing to uh, abandon everything like Jesus called the, the rich ruler to do. You have to be willing to uh, even lay down your lives and follow Jesus to the cross. Discipleship means total commitment. And we, we have Jesus' teachings summarized often in, in Matthew's Gospel. For example, in uh, chapters 5 through 7, the ethics of the kingdom, and chapter 10, the proclamation of the kingdom, chapter 13, the parables of the kingdom, emphasizing the presence of the kingdom, chapter 18, dealing with relationships in the kingdom, chapter, uh, chapters 23 through 25, dealing with the future of the kingdom uh, from Jesus' standpoint, including a judgment on the religious establishment, both at his day and at the time of his coming, if they're not ready. 
for his coming. We also have baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now John the Baptist was earlier baptizing and the message that went with that uh, of, of initiating people to make them ready for the kingdom, the, the message that went with that was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that message continues. Uh, that's John in chapter 3 and verse 2. In, in chapter 4 and verse 17, Jesus says repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In chapter 10 and verse 7, Jesus sends his disciples and, and says, uh, proclaim that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So we are still today, there's a continuity, still today to proclaim this message that God's kingdom, God's reign is at hand. God's demands are, are present on our lives to be ready for the time when God will do away with all injustice. God will establish peace so that we will be people of justice and people of peace to be ready for that time. And yet there's something new that's added because he says baptism, not just in the name of the kingdom, although that's there, you know, he says in uh, 28, 18, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Earlier in chapter 9, he says, Jesus has all authority on earth, uh, in heaven, but now he says all authority in heaven and on earth. He is the king in the kingdom of God. But also, baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit ranks Jesus with the Father and the Divine Spirit, which means that Jesus is portrayed as divine. And he says, I am with you in this task, as you're, as you're carrying out this task, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. That means he's the same one as in chapter 1 and verse 23, where he says, his name should be called Emmanuel, God with us. Or in chapter 18 and verse 20, where he says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. There was a Jewish saying back then, where uh, two or three are gathered for the study of the Torah, there is God's Shekinah, God's presence. Jesus claims to be the presence of God. So as we carry out this message, as we take this message to the nations, we are proclaiming Jesus' teachings and we're proclaiming Jesus' identity. We are calling people to the faith and we are discipling them in the faith. And this message and this mission will continue until Jesus returns.